What's up guys, welcome back to another video. A couple of weeks ago, Apple released its first Macintosh computers with Apple designed CPUs and GPUs based on the ARM architecture, and I immediately pre-ordered one for review. It arrived about a week ago, and I have been extensively testing it ever since. So today, we can finally take a look at the 2020 Mac Mini and the Apple M1 SoC. Starting off with the unboxing, there's really not much to set this computer apart as anything special. If you've bought a Mac Mini in the past 10 years, the packaging has looked the same as this. The only telltale sign that something is different is the little spec sticker on the side. My unit here is the base model with an 8-core CPU, 8-core GPU, 8GB of RAM, and a 256GB SSD. This is actually the first brand new computer I've bought in almost six years, so I gotta admit I had quite a bit of fun cracking this open. Apple has really minimized their paperwork in recent years. All this Mac Mini comes with is a quick start guide showing it hooked up to a Pro Display XDR, because if you're buying a $700 computer, you surely bought a $6,000 monitor to go with it, right? You also get some warranty info and this big silver Apple sticker. The computer itself really does look like almost any Mac Mini since 2011, but unlike that 2011 model, this one has zero upgradability whatsoever. Everything, even the SSD, is soldered on to one single PCB, a design choice that I am not a fan of. At least the I.O. is fairly decent. You get two USB 3.0 Type-A ports, a headphone jack, an HDMI 2.0 port, two sort of Thunderbolt 4 ports that can support data and display but not eGPUs, gigabit ethernet with no option for 10 gigabit ethernet, and of course your AC input. There's also a very large fan vent on the back which we'll talk about a little later. Overall, the lack of eGPU support and an IO selection that's a bit more limited than the Mac Minis have passed doesn't make for an inspiring exterior but it's what's on the inside that I am interested in. This Mac Mini comes preloaded with Apple's latest and greatest macOS 11 Big Sur, which on Apple Silicon enables it to run most iOS apps. In most cases, this doesn't work as well as you might imagine because very few iOS apps are designed for mouse and keyboard input. In almost everything I've tried so far, I've actually had a better experience running Android apps with Bluestacks on my Mac Pro, largely because Bluestacks can be set up to interpret keystrokes as joystick inputs, which is a big help in the control department. Other apps like Lightroom Mobile and Geekbench for iOS don't show up in the Mac App Store, so it seems there's a bit of blacklisting going on. Now, in order for legacy x86 apps to run on the M1 SoC, Apple created Rosetta 2. We'll talk about its performance a bit more in a minute, but generally speaking, it works every bit as well as Rosetta 1 did for the PowerPC Intel transition back in 2006. Not everything is compatible though. DaVinci Resolve, for instance, doesn't detect the Mac Mini's GPU at all, despite saying that the GPU was compatible during setup. There are some hiccups here and there, but overall it works so well it makes Microsoft's efforts at x86 emulation on ARM to look like an absolute joke. But let's take a look at performance. Starting off with Geekbench 5, I ran this test in Geekbench's Intel mode, and again in its M1 mode, and I'll be comparing it today against my 2013 12-core Mac Pro. As you can see, the M1's single-core performance is incredible and the multi-core performance actually beats the Mac Pro by a tiny bit in the M1 optimized test. The Intel performance is the most amazing part to me though. Pulling off a score of 5880 with an emulated CPU really is an incredible feat. Cinebench R23 was also very impressive, with the two coming in neck and neck. I'm not sure what was going on with the graph generator for this one, so just ignore the graph and look at the numbers. If you're wondering, all eight cores do actually spool up for Cinebench, so both the four little cores and four big cores can be put to work by an application at the same time. In both Blender's Classroom and BMW scenes, the 2013 Mac Pro still comes out on top. But bear in mind that Blender is an Intel app. If it was compiled for the M1 chip, it would probably match or beat the Mac Pro. 
Archiving sees a performance improvement of almost double on the Mac Mini, although this is also partially due to the much quicker SSD that it uses. And Safari was another surprise for me. It's clearly been majorly well-tuned for Apple Silicon, with the motion mark, speedometer, and jet stream tests coming in anywhere from two to three times faster than Safari on the Mac Pro. Moving on to video editing, my apologies again for the screwed up graph, I really don't know what happened here, but Handbrake is just barely faster on the Mac Pro, and this is Handbrake 1.4 Beta, which is optimized for the M1 chip. Final Cut Pro, though, is where this thing really sings. It chewed through the Bruce X benchmark in 24 seconds, which isn't bad, but it's not astounding either, but it also completed my 4K render test in a little over half the time the Mac Pro did. When I tiled that same 4K footage four times into the frame and rendered that out, the Mac Mini did lose quite a bit of its lead, but it still came out on top. My guess is if you have a very complex timeline with things like overlays and a bunch of multi-track audio, the two would probably come out pretty even, but none of my edits are that complex. Something else I tested was enabling stabilization on that 4K clip, and the Mac Mini beat out the Mac Pro by about 33% in analyzing that clip for motion. Gaming was also something I was interested in, so I loaded up Shadow of the Tomb Raider, set it to a mix of normal and low settings at 1080p, and ran the built-in benchmark. To be honest, I wasn't expecting much here, but the Mac Mini actually managed to average 30 FPS. Oh, and by the way, it only pulled a maximum of 23 watts of power from the wall while doing so. That's incredible, and this game isn't even optimized for the M1. It's doing this in what is basically fancy emulation. Also of note, the game detects the OS version as macOS 10.16. I'm not really sure why, but I found it interesting all the same. To measure the maximum temperature and power draw, I fully taxed the system by running Cinebench and Unigine Valley at the same time. This Mac Mini has way more temp sensors than any other Mac I've tested, and the labels on them aren't very helpful. But taking a look, we can see that the PACC MTR sensors are the hottest, reaching up to a toasty 85 degrees. The SOC, however, has never exceeded 70 degrees in all my testing. One thing I did notice, though, is that the cooling fan never turns off. I've heard a lot of reviewers mention that their Mac Minis never turn the fans on, but even at idle, I found the fan on this Mac Mini would just blow cold air. And it's so quiet it doesn't really matter, but I did find that kind of odd. Oh, and even under full system load, it only draws 40 watts from the wall. I didn't experience any thermal or power throttling though. After about 10 minutes of runtime, everything levels out, and it'll run there indefinitely, as far as I can tell. After seeing these temps though, I do suspect the passively cooled MacBook Air would throttle a bit under full load. Finishing out our benchmarks, Unigen Valley scored 1923, running at 1080p, and the Ultra preset. Curiously, it detects the GPU as being 256 megabytes, which kind of makes me suspect the GPU actually does have some RAM dedicated to it. I'm not going to cover the more mundane aspects of Big Sur in this video, but if you've used a Mac before, you'll feel right at home on the M1 Mac Mini. If you primarily use a computer for web browsing and email, I dare say you may never notice that it even has Apple Silicon in it, which is a major accomplishment by Apple. If you don't absolutely need a computer right now though, I'd recommend you hold off until next year, when the software will be out of beta and more mature, and the Apple M2 or whatever their next gen silicon will be called will be released. And if you're wondering, I am not giving up my Mac Pro for this mini. For starters, my RAID controller software is incompatible with Big Sur, and I simply don't like running on a platform that's this unproven. I will say this though, Good job, Apple. Hats off to you, you have piqued my interest by actually genuinely pushing the industry forward for the first time in over a decade, and I am looking forward to seeing what comes next. And to AMD, Intel, and Microsoft, good luck, because Apple is poised to make you look just as outdated as they did back when they released the PowerBook G4 in 2003. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked the video, Hit like, get subscribed, and ring the bell so you get notified when I post new videos, and I will see you guys in the next one.